Hi everybody, my name is Lyubo and you're with Ratio Talks. Today we're here with one of our guests from uh, the Ratio Forum in June this year. Uh, his name is Sebastian Aristoteles. He is the lead architect and co-founder of Saga Space Architects. Uh, they specialize in 3D printed architecture and habitation for outer space. Saga has built projects in Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, Europe and Northern Greenland. Saga recently also sent its first payload to outer space, which is a lamp for the International Space Station. Sebastian was uh, part of the two-man crew on the Lunark expedition, where he spent 100 days in isolation by the North Pole in a prototype space habitat, which was kind of insane. Um, Saga has won several awards and holds numerous world records for its architecture, such as the tallest 3D printed plastic structure at three meters tall. Uh, this is, in fact, the second time he's uh, visited Sofia. The first time was more than six years ago, uh, when his company was still in its uh, infancy. It's my absolute pleasure to see how much his company and ambition has grown over the last few years, and that we had the chance to, once again, have an occasion to talk about architecture, space, and life in between. Ladies and gentlemen, Sebastian Aristoteles. Hey Sebastian, good to have you again here. Thank you for having What's me. What's up? I uh, love your studio. Thank you, thank you. You seem mostly to love the Mosacard as we said <laughs> yesterday. We're going rural <laughs> as hell. It's and really the wine. Fun times. I, th I think there's a renewal of these rustic kind of dishes, you know, like yeah. food from the countryside. Yeah. Uh, f uh, traditional farming, farmer food is... Uh, and making your own bread and the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think we're just hipsters, to be honest. <laughs> I think that's... Uh, so, yeah, it, it feels weird. You, you were here like six years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when you last visited, you made like a, a whole gravity pavilion at one of our events. It was a wild, <laughs> wild thing. We were like um, uh, sewing planks and just building stuff with, uh, how do you call it in English? You know, the elevator lifts and stuff. Yeah. It was fucking radical. Yeah. It, it was a crucial point when we were here. You know, we had just yeah. started out our company and it was, it was the early days, you know, we were mm. full of of dreams and desires and a lot of naivety but we are here today and we've built a lot of shit uh, in between <laughs> so uh, <laughs> i think something worked out very well yeah i mean i was um a full disclosure i was uh, in your studio um a few months back in copenhagen uh, and it did look like an actual company <laughs> uh, it's not a shell company <laughs> Uh, it's not. It's not just like a placeholder on a business card. Apparently, those guys actually do actual projects. Yeah. And uh, before we go into the whole wild thing with you know space design, habitats on Mars, and the whole the whole shebang with training astronauts, you know the whole uh, thing uh, that probably sounds a bit abstract to most people. Um, tell us a bit about your actual business case with being an architect, because I saw you had. Uh, numerous projects that are in the making or already done, uh, which looked pretty pretty damn impressive as well. Yeah, so we are an architecture and engineering studio, right? And we have a deep passion for using uh, technology uh, in our projects. And I think, I like to think about it like this, it should not be visible that, it's, that technology is implemented mm. in our architecture. Yeah, uh, it should be invisible technology. Yeah. Um, but uh, but that's kind of how we attack many problems. We uh, we are not afraid of using novel technology. But but yeah, it's true. So we we've done many architectural projects around the world. We we have three D printed some of the largest houses in the world. Okay. Um, with the, like a concrete three D printer, um, which is very cool. It's. It's it's basically but like the whole house, like the, the whole house, yeah, okay. the whole house. On one go, or in, just different portions? Uh, in one go. So okay. of course the, you're limited by the size of your printer, but yeah. the printer we have in Denmark is, you know, uh, close to eleven by eleven uh, meters, cool. and uh, and eight meters tall, right? So it's it's a pretty big printer, um, and th and then we have uh, we printed Denmark's Denmark's biggest uh, 3D printed house. We did that two times beat our own record we've done it in guatemala 
uh, we've designed the largest housing in in Central America, 3D yeah. printed last summer. And then again, now they're 3D printing the next one, which is even bigger. Um, and uh, I think that'll be announced publicly here soon. Um, so we do a lot of these kind of uh, technology-based uh, architectural projects. Frontier projects. Frontier projects, yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and that now, of course, 3D printing, that's technology in the construction phase. Mm-hmm. A lot of our projects, it's technology at the design phase. And then maybe the execution is, and the construction is, more traditional manufacturing, mm. um, but the design and the shape and the form giving or the analysis has to do some kind of computational uh, mm. uh, algorithms. Um, another great uh, project we have done in, in, in Vietnam that is uh, going into final development now is, uh, is a large, uh, it, it's a large building, uh, a few thousand square meters. And when you build a building that big, for us, that's that's very big, you know. Yeah, it does sound big. It, 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 I'm used to building small habitats that's like 10 square meters, yeah. you know. <laughs> so, uh, 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 you know, it's, it's structures at that size, you are, you are kind of building at the scale of terraforming, right? Yeah. It's almost like you're almost putting a mountain into existence. So uh, for me, it comes with a lot of responsibility because yeah. you put a, you use a lot of materials, the electricity uh, demands for the lifetime of that building is, uh, you know, huge. Uh, so it comes with a, a lot of responsibility. And in that project, what we did was, because it's in Vietnam, we have a yeah. lovely tropical climate, vegetation grows incredibly fast. Yeah, really quickly. And, uh, you know, in cold Denmark, you know, sometimes when you see a garden outside, you know, it's like a half dead rose that's standing in the <laughs> cold, <laughs> foggy Danish uh, staying weather. Alive. <laughs> yeah, staying exactly. alive. And you're just, you just feel sorry for it uh, in yeah. the spring and in the autumn. But but in Vietnam, it grows like crazy. Nice. And uh, so what we did for that project, uh, it's quite interesting. We basically made a, a, a skin out of a thin uh, net of like metal mesh that mm-hmm. we could drag out over the entire building. And then we just invite uh, nature and plants to cover the building. And there's a couple of advantages to that. Uh, firstly, you can actually quite affordably, you can create a beautiful organic shape because mm-hmm. you it's just the mesh, which is a pretty uh, affordable building material. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's like a scaffold, basically. It's a scaffold or like a, almost like a fishing net, mm-hmm. but but out of uh, but out of small thin metal wires. So it doesn't weigh very much. It's quite affordable. There's not a lot of material in terms of uh, sustainability. It's 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 a lightweight structure, and you can make it look exciting and organic and and mm-hmm. cool. And then you just use the plants to fill out the gaps. And because it's Vietnam, it's going to grow like crazy. Yeah. So in one or two years, it's going to be almost completely full. And what happens is that you actually the plants they use the sun's energy for photosynthesis, right? Yeah. So so they they get the benefit from the energy. And at the same time, they shade yeah, the, they building. Cool the building. They, they cool the building, uh, and the energy demands for cooling down. You know, HVAC and uh, air conditioning and, uh, is a large portion, if not the largest, of of all the energy in the construction or building industry in Vietnam. Yeah, you can. You actually, it's it it's cheaper over time, but you also use less energy and it's more sustainable. So, huh. I think, and this is kind of where I think. And, and, you know, when you look at the building, you would never suspect that there has been a lot of computational efforts that gone into. Mm-hmm. Of course, we did a lot of um, models yeah. models and sun analysis and all these things. But it's a natural building, right? It's, 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 we're using vegetation and it's, it, it, it's, I like that we are, we are attacking the problem from a physics point of view. Yeah, it's basically s- some form of synergy with uh, with the local biosphere. Yeah, it's uh, it's not just like a foreign object that will be taken over by the biosphere, but by design, it's supposed to collaborate with the biosphere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's um, you know there's there's a bunch of uh, movies that are like post apocalypse, uh, yeah. and you see like New York in a hundred years, yeah. for example. Yeah, I love where, it. Yeah, you know it's been <laughs> overgrown, and basically you can see uh, like nature uh, taking uh, taking backgrounds and basically screwing up everything you know yeah. just destroying the concrete because you know yeah. with enough time and pressure it will be it will be taken over and it's interesting to think that uh, you could 
you could not start as an opponent to nature, but rather as a collaborator. Yeah, it's I, really interesting. I I like that idea. I think uh, I think this is still the early phase. I think we are still, at least as an architectural practice, we are still trying to figure out how do we do that. Mm -hmm. You know, in a tropical climate like Vietnam, there are some obvious things that work. In a colder climate like Denmark, a very windy, harsh environment, mm -hmm. um, it's there's it's it's a it's a little less obvious how we are gonna mm -hmm. do it similarly. But I think if you look at You know, when you talk about a post-apocalyptic uh, New York, I almost think about I'm Legend and Will mm -hmm. Smith running exactly. around <laughs> in that the was, street. That was my <laughs> thought as well. And, yeah, and there's like, uh, you know, yeah, and there's a deer going through the streets of Manhattan. But um, I think if you look at the types of animals that also move into these areas, mm -hmm. it's also like... Like hipsters. <laughs> Yeah. Those yeah. are the worst animals. Eating, yeah. eating farmer, uh, uh, old timer countryside food, right? Produce, uh, yeah. But no, but some of the animals, it's also like mountain pigeons, right? Because mm -hmm. the big tall buildings are more mountains than they're actually mm -hmm. buildings. Mm -hmm. Or uh, so I think. I think there's definitely an opportunity there to think about the the biosphere and the environment and the microclimate around the buildings. Uh, more than just we have building and then we have nature. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and these are some of the steps that we are thinking about a lot. There was a, uh, an architect from Denmark and, you know, the name escapes me at this point, but uh, I think he did a few a few projects in Copenhagen specifically. One, I think, is uh, in an electricity generating central that made it like an artificial mountain where people actually hike. Yeah, that was one of his projects, and the other was like a building complex where it was done in terraces, and it still looks kind of like a mountain where you have like a big garden on top of the Absolutely, whole thing. Absolutely, yeah. What was the name of the guy? Bjarke, Bjarke yeah. Engels. Yeah, Bjarke Engels. Yeah, a very famous Danish architect, and I think he he's doing something like this. Uh, yeah, roughly. yeah, he is, he is. But I think what he's doing it is a, in a very literal, like he literally put a skiing slope on top of a building. You know, like it's a very literal translation, mm -hmm. and and I think and I think that's kind of, I think that's fascinating in in itself. But I think there is a there's a deeper potential as well, mm -hmm. where it's mm -hmm. it's not like the skiing slope is very much a mountain for humans, mm -hmm. but it could also be a mountain for the animals and the climate around, right? Yeah. So Copenhagen goats, yes, <laughs> yeah. For example, I mean, how how wonderful would it be if we, when Pretty we were sitting cool. out on the terrace and you know uh, you hear the mountain goat coming uh, climbing yeah. by? Um, but but I think I think um, I think for example another great example is uh, energy is often okay. So we we are in this climate crisis about mm -hmm. sustainability. The building sector is you know enormously responsible for a lot of the greenhouse gas emissions and. Energy is really a, it's, it's a weird thing because it's it's an exchange, right? Like, mm. for example, in some places you're cooling while in other places you're heating. And uh, sometimes why don't you just, in, like, for example, there's a lot of, uh, when you have a metro system uh, underground, mm -hmm. there's usually a lot of heat that builds up and, and, and needs to escape. Why can't you use that heat to heat, uh, you know, a skyscraper on top of it. Hmm. And there, ha there, ha there are, uh, you know, a specific project where they're actually testing this out. I think it's in Sweden. Hmm. Um, but there are some opportunities here where I think we need to be conceptually smarter when we commit to making a building, that it should be more hmm. than just a building. It a, should... More of a system analysis of the whole thing. Yes, a system analysis. And then you need to be a bit courageous enough to think about what like you are really building any building i would argue is almost an artificial mountain right mm. you're putting together stone and rock and timber and like can it do something more than just being a building mm. uh, and can we use some of the energy wasted energy or potential energy from somewhere else in in this entire system of a building um yeah uh you know yesterday when we went for uh dinner yeah uh, lovely in, dinner by the way in co kitchen by the way yeah yana from co kitchen is is fantastic um we spoke with one of the other speakers for the forum uh and that we'll be having tomorrow we're recording on friday and we'll probably publish next week but anyway uh at the dinner uh i spoke with uh steven Mojic, yeah 
uh, who's um, uh, the rock guy <laughs> at our event. And he said something interesting, and I've been thinking about it as well. We even have a podcast about it that's called uh, The Hollow Beyond. And it's essentially looking at, at life, uh, not only um, as an extension of all the different kinds of life, like from bacteria to microscopic life, such as humans, etc., uh, and not only um, in the sense that uh, you know, when you look at the crusts, you know, you scratch the crust, and that's the amount of life that you find. But looking at the whole thing, looking at, up until the stratosphere, looking at the whole Earth as a as a combination of um, uh, not only conditions but also a collaboration with the earth itself not only in the biological sense but the physical sense mm -hmm. as a thing that needs to be taken into account when we talk about life the, the discussion was based on can we settle foreign worlds well i mean that's a difficult question because right uh we only have one example right now and this collaboration might be more difficult than we think. Mm -hmm. And uh, it sounds to me like what you're doing is in that direction, trying to look at the whole system in a way that it works well together, not just try and make an outpost of life somewhere, but try to be embedded in the biosphere, but also in the whole structure of, uh, uh, of the place you're building in general. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it, it comes from... It's interesting. It comes from these thoughts we've had about space architecture, right? And w when you put humans in an artificial environment uh, and resources are scarce, uh, a habitat is almost like a little mini planet. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's a limited amount of oxygen, water, mm. energy, food, um, all these things you need to be very conscious of. And if you can recycle them, it's great. Hmm. And I think it's the same mindset that we are now trying to really bring to the big scale of architecture. Hmm. And, um, and, and, and I agree very much with, um, you cannot just look at an individual thing. I think a, a good example is, for example, um, in space, one of the big issues is air, right? Hmm. We need air to breathe. Um, yeah. You know, I, and it happens that we, you know, we have developed this mechanical device, which is called the CO2 scrubber, which, you know, when I exhale and, you know, I've converted some uh, oxygen to mm -hmm. carbon dioxide, a CO2 scrubber basically runs the, uh, the carbon dioxide through a, a filter and takes out the carbon and mm -hmm. releases oxygen back out. Mm -hmm. And that's a system, and, and, it's, and it's consumable. You need to exchange the filters and all of that. It just happens that there are organisms that actually do the exact same thing and they do it incredibly well. And they have evolved through thousands, millions of years on earth. And it's plants, right? It's it's all photosynthetic living uh, things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have always liked the idea that instead, okay, you probably need a mechanical life support system, mm -hmm. but can't we support it with a biological life support system with an algae bioreactor that hmm. you have, you know, you have a tank of water and algae is, if you get the right algae, it's incredibly resilient. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you can, you know, so it lives in this body of water and uh, and you can just feed it your carbon dioxide and it mm. takes, and it actually uses it, yeah. uh, right? For something productive other than just a filter that just filters it out. And I think that's interesting ways to think about it. So I think, we are trying to design buildings as part, especially, I think there's a responsibility when we, the larger scale that we do, you could say the ultimate scale is a city. Mm -hmm. There, it's really a big system you're designing, yeah. right? Um, and that's complicated. It's very, very complicated, uh, designing a city. I think there are many examples of how you do not want a city to be yeah. designed. But can you, um let's say if you want to design either a city or a, like a city block or just you know, like really big set of buildings, um, is there a way in which we can uh, address building those not 
by making like a whole project with a whole model and the whole thing yeah. and just having a set thing and then you just send it to the constructors and to the builders and they'll just build the whole thing. Uh, is there a way in which we can do it in a more, uh, how should I say it, lean way, yeah. like an iterative way, yeah. just, you know, set specific rules and conditions. Yeah. So for it to grow it, yeah. in the same sense that biology does it. Yeah, I, I love that. So uh, we've been thinking about this a lot and uh, I completely agree. I think some of the, some of my favorite cities are organic cities. It's cities that have an, a medieval history you know, not that that is a good thing in itself. You know, that's not. I think. I think that, yeah. that's not. That's not. That's Putting not people what, on spikes. Yeah, exactly. Yes, or not. burning witches uh, or stuff like that. But I think. Um, I think the organic element, something that is, that has unpredictable characteristics. You, it's not a completely rational grid. When you stand in one street and you look down, everything is curving, and there's three-dimensionality to it and mm. there's bridges and there's um, a, a, a level of unpredictability. I think that is a mm. beautiful city. It's often romantic cities, right? There's a richness. There's a richness. And then you could say, okay, but from an infrastructure point of view, it's not efficient and it's not, um, you know, garbage disposal is inefficient. And, you know, if everyone is have different apartments, then everything is custom made, which is resource intensive and stuff like that. And there is an argument for that. But I think you can find a sweet spot in between. Hmm. And what we are what we are kind of working towards is proposing a way to design cities where. So ultimately, the most sustainable thing you can do in city development is making something that is uh, permanent. Because if you if if something can live for or stay for a long time, you don't have to demolish it and rebuild it. I think you you save a lot of resources there. So hmm. if I could design. Uh, you know the city block you mentioned so it doesn't survive just for 50 years but for 100 or 200 years mm. I think that would be interesting mm. and what we realized is that I think the only permanent way to do architecture is to prepare for uh, adjustments and for retrofitting and mm. for uh, so the only permanent thing is being non-permanent if that mm. kind of makes sense um, so that's one thing the other thing I think is uh, that we want to avoid is these hotspots of monocultures. Hmm. So many cities uh, have like a, a, a monoculture. So you have an area where this is all the uh, high society, wealthy yeah. p places. This or is the business place. This is the business place. This is the yeah. uh, hipster place with all the cafes and skaters. And, and I think what you ideally want of course, you will always have a little bit of that. And I think there's some attractiveness as well. But what you ideally want is a mix, right? You want yeah. heterogeneity. You don't mm -hmm. want a homogen body of just one thing. And so, bubbles of, of different focuses. Yeah. And I think, um, and, and, and there's some beautiful things that also happen if you design these uh, cities in a way where that is uh, obtainable. So for example, you can't, you, you need, so what we propose is that you, when you develop, when you do a master plan and you develop something, you say it has to be a mixed program. You say, uh, save 20% for social housing. Hmm. In the same building block that you have penthouse, ultra expensive luxury apartments, mm -hmm. um, there will be a natural kind of a price difference from the bottom of the building to the top of the building. If there's a big view, if you have access to a roof, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. prime real estate. And then if you have darker areas and uh, you know and, and and smaller apartments that's less attractive real estate and i think that's okay you know I, when i was a student as well i also lived in a tiny apartment squeezed together and that i loved it right that was mm. that was a, a great place to live um and i think these things can exist in kind of a in within a block itself mm. um so that's one thing the other thing i think is interesting is um is there a way where a building and th th now we're talking about more futuristic this is kind of like maybe a hundred year perspective mm -hmm. we are working with 3d printing because I, I i i i don't see a future where houses are not 3d printed if that makes sense mm -hmm. it's not that i you could say i believe in 3d printing but it's more that i there's not a future where it doesn't exist mm -hmm. like it will be a, one of the major construction method, methods of the future because of efficiency or 
because um, two things: efficiency, so or effectiveness. I think if you look at any industry, uh, agriculture in the last 60 years, agriculture productivity per man hour has yeah. increased 16 fold. So one farmer 60 years ago with one hour could produce, let's say, 100 calories. Today, mm. that same farmer can produce 1,600 calories. Mm. The construction industry is completely flat. Mm. There's been tiny bumps, on the, but it's completely flat. There's almost no productivity increase today compared mm. to 60 years ago. But because it's mostly guys, you know, showing their butt cracks and you know, doing, like, <laughs> and, uh, doing masonry. Yeah, I, and, and like when I think about it, it's like, but the machines have gotten better and I don't understand why. But when you look at the graphs, it's quite clear, like the productivity increases mm-hmm. is, hasn't increased significantly. Like, it's, it's almost completely flat. And, um, you know, take the clothing business. Like now there are like, you know, there, there's fast fashion and then you could like, that's not a good thing, but the... Mm-hmm effectiveness is very very mm. high it's a product of that effectiveness yeah. and uh, so we need a future where architecture and the building in or the build environment is um, has higher productivity hmm. and 3d printing is a, is a way to get there so that's one thing the other reason why i think it's going to be the future is that you have we're looking at a future where uh, i mean we went from hand drawing as an mm. architect to CAD modeling, to like CAD modeling is computer-aided yeah. design. You are uh, sitting and drawing on computer doing 3D models. AutoCAD. AutoCAD, Revit, Rhino, Fusion, like all these uh, uh, programs. And um, I'm from a generation where we, you know, we have nev- I've never tried to draw a building by hand, right? But my dad, rem- my, my dad is also an architect and he, of course, he started out mm-hmm. drawing it by hand. So, so that's a transition. And then in the last 15 years, we went into parametric modeling. So parametric modeling is a, you are designing some, it's almost like programming a little bit. You're designing mm-hmm. some rules. So instead of I say, I want to, let's say I have a house. I, I don't tell it, I want a window here, here, and here. I say every two meters, I want a window. Mm-hmm. And if there is a door, then I want a window on each side and then the computer hmm. program kind of iterates di- iterates yeah. and distributes the windows themselves so that's parametric modeling hmm. and now we're getting into a phase of generative modeling so we all hear about ai and artificial intelligence and all these things i don't know if that's exactly what i of course that will at some point come to the architect industry but i think we are looking at a future where architecture is generated you will set a few parameters up that are very abstract mm-hmm. And it will actually generate mutations of buildings. So you'll have, um, uh, like, maybe you tell it to give you a thousand examples of, mm. you know, you give it a plot. It's this, the sun is there, it's located in Sofia, mm-hmm. Bulgaria, and da, da, da. And it'll give you a, a thousand different versions of a house. Mm-hmm. And you basically validate the ones that uh, the, fit your criteria. Well, yeah. It could be a static criteria, functional, etc. Yeah. And... Nice. Um, and then you have a house that has a weird shape and it's generated by a computer and it would be incredibly difficult for a human to build. Hmm. So, and that's the scenario where it makes sense to have a 3D printer because a hmm. 3D printer, okay, the only reasons why a lot of houses, they look the same is because it's cheaper to build it uh, square, right? Hmm. A lot of houses are square, rectangular windows, doors, all hmm. of that. That's not, if you look at how nature builds, nature builds much more organically. It yeah. follows... It follows like uh, structures in, in nature are beautiful because they f- they are all minimal structures. They follow, you know, there's no waste. Mm. If you look at the leaf, if you look at the structure on a leaf, you know, it's like a main structural beam and then there's threads going out. Path of least resistance type of thing. Yeah. yeah. And it's and, and and because it's very you don't want to waste any cells on something that mm. it, it doesn't have a purpose. And I think the future of architecture is going to be the same because mm. we are lack resources, but also then you can optimize a house for exactly the needs that 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 it needs to fulfill. That that seems absolutely absolutely logical. But um, when we talk about needs, um, you know, right now we've been talking about the the functionality uh, in terms of building like structure integrity, integration within 
the uh, ecosystem within the place where it's built within the whole city etc uh, but obviously there's also one critical factor which is the people that are actually living there and because we as humans unlike uh, animals and plants we have a, a more complex behavior mm. and um, mainly because of our additional layer of socialness mm. uh, our additional layer of interaction politics even etc uh, the way that we uh, interact with each other is highly influenced by environment and you can see this um, in, in a bunch of examples you can see this uh, how people react uh, in different countries on different uh, questions how yeah. they react in different rooms in yeah. different settings yeah. etc uh, what's uh, how they're likely to be uh, more positively inclined or more negatively inclined depending on the lighting depending on uh, whether if it's good weather outside etc so we're highly biased biased by our environment. Mm. So when we talk about criteria for uh, for building buildings, um, that surely should be factored in, in, in some sense. Yeah. And uh, I haven't seen many examples, or at least uh, I've only heard of very few examples of this being an actual concern. So have you thought about this? Yeah, so um, it, it's funny, like uh, culture, shapes our behavior for sure and um I, i think a good example is sometimes you meet a friend from or you, you meet your friend group from like elementary school and you had a certain role back then like mm. everyone were like you we all evolve and change and adapt and and when you meet old friends you all of a sudden become the same person that you were 15 years mm. ago right and i think that also is, is an interest so it's not just at a large scale of a culture but it's also like a microculture. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for sure. So uh, we thought about it very much. And a house in Denmark should not look the same as a house in Vietnam. And a house in Bulgaria should not look the same as a house in Norway. Yeah, because you guys have money. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's why. Um, uh, <laughs> no, I think. Uh, but I think there's a local climate. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. So, of course, like like building envelopes should be different right energy available energy is different than yeah that's one thing culturally we have a completely different background mm -hmm. we all start now watching tiktok and youtube and netflix and all these things but the content is still quite different and we still have a legacy and heritage culturally mm -hmm. that is different um and uh, so of course the houses should also be different and uh, i think there is happening Like, if you look at a, a shopping mall, if I just showed you the inside of a shopping mall, I bet you wouldn't be able to tell if it's a shopping mall in Bulgaria or if it's a shopping mall in Croatia or if it's a shopping mall in Denmark. Mm. I, I think they look all very similar. Yeah. And and for me, that doesn't make sense because these buildings should... Like, in the last 30 years, there's been happening this in, internationalization. Copy-paste. Yeah. And it's like... It's, it's the same type of concrete structures and all of that, but they are not adap adapted for the local culture and the local uh, environment. Um, and, and, I, and I think that's a bit sad. I remember reading my... So when I was a teenager, I traveled around the world. I went around the globe one time. Mm -hmm. I was kind of going in the footsteps. Of course you did. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Yeah. yeah, and, and uh, I, I was kind of going in the footsteps of, 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 of some family members that had traveled like 30 years before me. And nice. I remember reading the diary from when they traveled in, the, uh, in Asia 30 years ago, specifically actually Vietnam. Mm. And they describe what they meet and going to Japan and all these places, and um, especially some, some of the less developed countries. And... Um, And, and, I, and I go there, and of course, a lot of stuff has happened since then, but I can just see that everything is becoming more and more similar. It's not as exotic. I think mm. also just from a Japanese person going to Denmark, it must also be, I'm sure it's still exotic, but it must still be a little bit less romantic than it used to be because mm. there the, the, the used to be such a difference. So I think there's a, I think we need to move away from that and get back to, Like what is the local beauty of a place and celebrate it mm -hmm. and listen to what people actually want in that local culture.
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just celebrating the diversity of yes. different identities. Yes. yes. Because uh, you know, there's a um, right now the the whole discussion about uh, differences, etc. It's mostly in the cultural sphere related to you know personal matters. It could be like sexualities, etc. But what you're saying is uh, the celebrating the differences of you know even microcultures uh, in the way that I understand you and. Um, you know, in Bulgaria, it's been really rough in the last 15 years. I mean, for example, I have a lot of friends that don't enjoy our local culture. And mm. when they compare, mm. let's say, a Bulgarian aesthetics, like uh, the types of clothing or the types of houses or whatever, to, let's say, Denmark or whatever, mm. they say, oh, we have such a peasant view of mm. aesthetics. We don't know shit. But truth is, it's uh, uh, this is highly uh, influenced by the fact that we are coming into a world that's uh, richer and that uh, shows more opportunity and that colors the way that we see yeah. the local identities and aesthetics. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely right that we need to value uh, the different aesthetics and the different um, identities of, of a local culture. I think that's really important and it definitely brings not only value for us yeah. but also to to, to, the, to the whole world yeah. essentially I, i i agree and i think uh, um i mean we're sitting now talking in english right so of yeah. course we are internationalized in some way which is a good thing obviously most the portion the word in the book exactly det lyder rigtig godt jeg er glad for at være her i dag exactly what i thought yeah um but i i um, um but i think um Uh, there will be a retro call like there will be a retro um i think it's already happening a little bit where the uh, the local food for example like mm. your heritage is actually becoming a beautiful thing again mm. and and i think mm. that 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 makes me happy it's again a richness yeah it's a richness a, yeah. a diversity of experience that's it's uh that's worthwhile keeping. It's the same with languages, for example. Yeah. You know, okay, English is useful, it's practical, but do I want just one language uh, to be you know, the most dominant language on earth yeah. and have nothing else yeah. except in history books? I think we'd be missing out on a lot of stuff. Yeah, I, I agree. It's gonna be shit. Yeah. I, I read a book, uh, I, I, I like the last couple of years, I've been getting really into sci-fi books mm. and uh, It, it had to happen, before, you know, sooner or later. <laughs> it was kind of, you know, I, I used to love sci-fi movies. I, I still do a lot, but uh, but now I'm kind of opening up the world of sci-fi books and mm. have recommendations afterwards. Yes, yes, please. Um, and uh, and I read, you know, a lot of American. There's a lot of American sci-fi, and then I read a Chinese sci-fi book, uh, the Which three one? Th- three body problem. Yeah, it's ah, fucking amazing. Yeah, and I think what's interesting. interesting Even though they are both, in, I, I read a translated copy, yeah. obviously, um, <laughs> and that, that otherwise it would be a challenge. Um, and even though it's translated to grammatically perfect English, it is so like the way that the way that things are described is so different. Yeah, it's like uh, there's a much more uh, an. Uh, Uh, analogies and like mm. you're describing a situation by u- using another situation to describe mm. and there's like a way that is so different even though the words are the same if you look at a you know mm. it's the same english words and i think that's interesting that you can still feel the this, difference yeah the difference because it comes from a different place and yeah. it's true uh, languages really define the way we think about things and you know creativity in different languages both in terms of writing but even just uh, expressing some some wants and desires are different in different cultures and different languages and yeah. that's again a richness yeah yeah i agree and and uh, that's also why i like to be here in sofia <laughs> is because there's a there's a different culture yeah. and there's a there's a different attitude that i think is kind of interesting Uh, another thing uh, related again to this, to the whole um, social dynamic um, is, I'll give you an example. Um, right now in, in Sofia, I think it would be pretty easy to find like people that live in a, in a random uh, block that really don't know any of their neighbors. Yeah. 
you'd, you'd go, you'd live in your own apartment for 20 years and you might not know even the guy that lives downstairs. You might meet and just say, hey, hi, whatever, but you don't even know his name. And I think that this has been uh, in some places, I'm not uh, claiming that it's like a blight or something, mm, but mm. like I can see that it's um, this... In not only industrialization, but digitalization and uh, encapsulation with social media, etc., is driving us to be more capsulated and within bubbles. And those bubbles are also our homes. Mm-hmm. I'm curious whether this could also be addressed with uh, design and architecture, whether we can make our societies more open and more collaborative. Uh, the example you gave with one building housing people of different means, you know, I think works towards that. Uh, I'm I'm just curious. Have you thought about how we can make the world not equal, but at least more interactive? Yeah. So, so it's I think it's interesting, and um, it's kind of like in psychology. There's this phenomenon that if you have an emergency in a street, the more people that are in the street, the less of a chance that anyone will interfere mm. with uh, the, what's going on. And I think it's a little bit the same. Like when you are in a city, there's more people. But you know less. You know you know your neighbors less than if you are in the countryside. And I experience this extremely when I'm out in these remote places, like in northern Greenland, mm-hmm. where it's you know there's very 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 few people, and the environment is very dangerous if if you if you if you don't handle it right. Um, and there you really you don't you know none of the people there, but you very quickly get to know people because they are, you are very dependent on each other. Um, I think I think it's a challenge in a city. I think um, there has to be ways to do it with architecture. I don't have the answer yet um, because it's like you can basically go. So what you need to do is you need to force people to interact together, and you need you need to force people to be a little. The way you put people together is to be a little bit vulnerable together. So mm. if people are, if you work out together. Like uh, I think that like if if, if th- that would be good if you, but if you if if you if you can't get under the skin together somehow, uh, I don't think you will you, you will get that kind of uh, it's kind of I think that's why in going out and drinking together is a good thing because you hmm. you um, you let go a little bit and the day after you're a little tired and hungover so your para- your your facades are a little bit down so it's actually I think it's the hangover that actually brings you a little bit together it's a productive yeah. pass <laughs> yeah exactly Interesting. Um, because because you you are a little bit you show your true nature and uh um, show and, that you're an asshole. Yeah, that's, or you are, or, 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 or you're not an asshole, <laughs> or you are, or, or, or that uh, you know. And 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 I think you need that to kind of get together, uh, mm. since, like genuinely. How you do that at the scale of a city is difficult, right? Um, but but it, 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 it has to be possible at the scale of a building. It has to be possible. Uh, something I saw in uh, Copenhagen last time, it's probably a common thing and, or, or not. How, how should yeah. I know? Uh, we stayed in the, close, to the, close to the docks in a hotel there. And there was a bunch of new, new buildings there. Uh, so we went to get some breakfast and coffee. Uh, and a, unassuming like a cafe and so right in front of the cafe because it's the on the zero floor of a pretty bu- big building mm-hmm. there was a gym and yeah. there was a sauna yeah. so outside it was something like seven degrees or yeah. something insane and you see like 20 something people with towels just you know steaming off yeah. after being in the sauna yeah. who apparently live in the live in the building yeah and it just looked so glorious and alien at the same time you literally looking at a bunch of people yeah naked and uh, during winter yeah first yeah and second it's not something that i can uh imagine in in sofia right now I, I cannot see an example in the same sense so would you say that this kind of like an explicit place uh of collaboration is a uh, is is the solution or do you think it's in a more infrastructural ways like I, always you know interweaving or i, th- I, I think uh, i think what you are describing there is exactly a great example of of, of, of bringing people together yeah. within a building um it's it's again you're a bit vulnerable it's cold you're you're not gonna keep your dis- like it you are in it together right yeah. 
I think in um, in Hollywood movies, the interaction is always by the mailbox in the in the you know in the reception of a building. You know, like mm. are you are in the elevator or something. I think if you can extend that beyond this social courtesy thing, that's what you want to do, right? Mm. If it's a, a sauna outside that works in cold Denmark, uh, I don't know if it works here, but um, if you can extend that somehow, I think it's good. Mm. Um, I think uh, now I have a little kid, I can see how as my kid is getting older and now we are going to playgrounds and stuff, um, you also like you are hanging out there right so mm. you will also meet other parents and and then it, you start to learn your neighbors in a different way so i think you need to force people to kind of spend time together i i know from other projects that we are doing that humans are spending more and more time indoors we're spending in denmark it's a little over 90 percent of our time is spent inside mm. in the u.s i think it's closer to 93 percent of the time jesus christ yeah and and um the reason why i know that is because uh Uh, the lighting environment inside mm. it's very difficult to get a healthy lighting environment we are really made for sunlight and the spectrum of sunlight but but that also makes me think that we are interacting less and less physically together because if mm. we are inside you know there's netflix and now there's vr and there's mm. all these there's phones and all these things that makes us inside less and um, so it's interesting Uh, I, I I don't have the answer yet, but it's something that we're working on as well. Yeah, cool, cool. And if we uh, have to look towards the future, um, because end of the day, your one of your main uh, points is actually the future of humanity in space. Uh, that's the that's the more more abstract thing, right? That's yeah. why I wanted to talk about actual architecture initially. But end of the day, um, your ambition is to create healthy environments uh, in space. So do you think that's a, that's a possible goal at all? Because uh, well, we've just outlined all the different kinds of pressures and issues we have right now. Mm. Uh, as you saw, I mean, uh, trying to work in collaboration with the environment, with uh, the biosphere, between each other, the whole thing is actually really difficult in a place that's basically optimized for us yeah uh and we'll we'll go on a rock somewhere yeah. in the middle of space that yeah. wants to kill you with pleasure if it can yeah. you know yeah, experience yeah. pleasure and we were saying that yeah well yeah it's gonna be good you know people will will enjoy this yeah is this a realistic goal definitely realistic uh and i'm, I'm not just <laughs> saying that like if, if you look at uh human nature and, and migration Um, it's uh, like I spend a hundred days in Northern Greenland and, uh, you know, <clears throat> I had a carbon fiber uh, space habitat with 140 kilograms of lithium batteries and, you know, sunrise lighting systems and powdered food and satellite phone and all these things. 4,000 years ago, in the same location, the early native Greenlandic people lived there. Hmm. And keep in mind, this is all the way up close to the North Pole. Hmm. It's dark for five months out of the year. There's no sunlight. Um, uh, how did they survive without electricity? Like hmm. in this cold and dangerous environment, I, I like that to me is as difficult as an environment with the technology they had back then as sending someone to space and letting them survive on the moon hmm. or thrive on the moon. I think it's in human nature to live in these places. Uh, I, uh, well, it's not in human nature to live there, but it's in human nature to go there and, and conquer adapt. and adapt. Uh, and when I say conquer, I don't mean, uh, you know, colonialism <laughs> and and uh, and and kill the people that are already there. I just mean conquer the environment. Hmm. Like I, I live in 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 Denmark, and if we didn't have technology like clothing and insulated buildings and heating. Mm -hmm. We would not be able to live in in Denmark. Hmm. The human body is made to survive around the equator, right? Without hmm. like that's that's where we all originate from originally, um, and then we have just migrated. So I think it's just a natural next step uh, is to live uh, on the moon, but future generations on Mars and probably hmm. beyond. Basically, uh, using technology as an extended phenotype. You know, like yeah. clothing <laughs> is you yeah. know 
better fur yeah and yeah. a habitat yeah. is just a better capsule for your body yeah that's interesting and um but again i mean i'll, I'll have to press you on this a bit yeah uh, sure yes uh, there will be an ad adaptation there will be ways in which we will be surviving yeah but is it realistic for us to thrive i mean that's the i think that that's the key thing because i think um earth with all its issues including mm. our own um is is easy mode mm. and it seems like space is on hardcore mode mm. uh so uh yes you you could imagine habitats there's a whole project right now uh that's following um the Artemis uh, mission mm. by NASA, mm. you know, they want to colonize uh, the moon in the next years, you know, to, to just have like a permanent uh, Seleno stationary uh, base there and then just have a settlement on the moon and then use the moon as a stepping stone to regular settlements on Mars. And I think all of those are realistic. Mm. Uh, but is it a thing that will thrive? Is it a thing that will be healthy is it the thing that people would want to be there beyond for some economic reasons or scientific yeah. reasons um not the first people it will be uh it, it will be survivalists it will be a strange uh, lifestyle i spent uh, on two occasions some time in a danish american military base called tule air base up in northern greenland hmm. and i imagine life on Mars will be very similar when mm. you're there in the winter. Uh, you're basically inside all the time. Outside, it's in, you know it's dark outside. Mm. Uh, I was at, in in Tulin in the, in the winter time, um, and but there are individuals that actually thrive in these conditions, mm. and um, th these. I have some tendencies that makes it attractive for me as well. I think I'm. Half and half. I think uh, I definitely would also be challenged in these environments, but I think I can see there's a part of me, and, and I talk from experience, right? I, I, I spent two months inside a habitat in, in the Arctic, and there was an element to that lifestyle. I remember I, I, some days I thought, I, I, I can do this. You know, this mm. is actually, there's some things about it that are more pleasant than everyday life. Mm. Um, it sounds fetishistic. A bit. <laughs> it does. Maybe this. I don't know. There, there was there was n nothing sexual about it. It was all uh, just m mindset and, and mood. And I think it's it's like a it's a simple life. Mm -hmm. It's a predictable life, and there's a routine, and there is you are connected. To, okay, so I actually think I can paint you a picture that makes it a bit, uh, uh, that makes it attractive. And then, of course, there's a lot of things that are, you don't have your family, you don't have your girlfriend or boyfriend and your kids and parents. Mm. And of course, that's horrible. Most people are going to find that, some people are probably going to be okay, but most people are going to find that uh, not very attractive at all. But you are there, there's no distractions there's no noise from social media. There, uh, you are completely uh, in touch with your own um, survival. Like, if I want water to drink and to eat, I need to go outside, chop some ice, bring it inside, melt it, and uh, and consume it. And the, the, if if I want lights turned on, I need to go out, turn on the generator, or fishing reactor or whatever you have on uh, uh, in a mass colony um so you are in you know we have been so detached from what is actually keeping us alive mm. that i think being a bit more connected in control. yeah and and connected with actually staying alive it, it, it's rewarding in a way hmm. and um the predict predictability it you know i i had uh, deep thoughts in a way that I had not had since I was kid, a kid, because I think we are all, I mean, let's say on a good day, maybe you go an hour without being distracted. Mm. Let's say that's a good day, right? I think sometimes it's every five minutes, there's a notification or there's something, someone grabbing your attention or something like that. And I, I remember being a kid and just being lost in a world of thought and 
fairy tales and you know imagination and and that i experienced for the first time since my early teenage years mm. again in greenland being isolated it almost sounds like a silent retreat yes exactly right there yeah. is yeah slow living silent retreat there's an element of that as well hmm. there's um yeah, it, your description kind of sounds like the the perfect place for you know survivalists yeah you know the the, the way that I imagine it is, you know, there's there's uh, animals that live at the bottom of the ocean, yeah. for example, like extreme of extreme yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. at crushing depths, and you know that's a niche that they filled because obviously it's a niche that can get filled. Yeah. So maybe our intuition, uh, whether something is suitable or not, uh, would change based on the people that go there, yeah. and you know, uh, the lineage of people that start living in those environments would have a whole different aesthetic, uh, would have a whole different approach, and you know, the culture would, might change as well. Yeah, and I think we're also talking about there's eight billion people on Earth, right? The first colony is going to be what fifty, one hundred, two hundred, three hundred people. It's going to be a village at best. Yeah, of course you're going to find 300 people that, and you are going to do a, a thorough screening. Of course you're going to find 300 people that are actually uh, attracted and know themselves well enough that it's a lifestyle that they would like. Mm. Um, so I think, and, and let's, you know, any early migration or settlement is incredibly uh, non-luxurious mm. you know it's a uh, I, I think back to some of the early colonies if you read about you know jamestown the first kind of um uh, european settlement in uh, uh, north america it was quite shit you know it was mm -hmm. actually incredibly uncomfortable for everyone i think from the natives and for the people living there i think it was just nobody was having fun yeah and i think i think i think it's yeah i think it attracts uh, some people that that can find some solitude and enjoyment mm -hmm. there but i think it's also just and it will be of course a little bit like that as well when you go to mars and you know this uh, you have the pressures of just this really alien really dangerous environment you have the pressures of this solitude etc but also if we have to uh, you know circle back to our initial conversation uh, there's going to be different pressures from a uh, an entirely design perspective because you would have to have an adapted um an adapted building if we have a permanent colony let's say on mars you would have to have an adapted building to uh the physics of the place because it's not going to be just like a house on uh, in vietnam yeah it's gonna be a real horror show it might be in caves it might be something else the gravity is different yeah so this means that the specific way that this place looks will be foreign as well, which will probably lead to some different habits and yeah. to some different um, influences. I, I agree. And one thing I like to think about is like, um, what kind of traditions will they have? Uh, mm. You know, our traditions and our holidays are built upon, or festivities are built upon, like there's a reason behind it. Like, uh, um, I think that they will have, they will, like on Mars, you have these huge dust storms. Hmm. In Denmark, you have, you celebrate Christmas very th intensely because the dark period is so sad that I think you need something to look forward to. You have Christmas as a big kind of, it's in right in the middle of the darkest times of, uh, um, uh, of the year. And, uh, uh, but we make it into a cozy, nice experience. Mm -hmm. Family experience. Yeah. And I think, I think we're going to have the same in uh, uh, in um, uh, on Mars. I think we, when there is these huge dust storms that's going to cover the entire planet for several weeks, mm -hmm. and very little light is going to penetrate through, we'll have in the in the peak of the darkness there will be a big holiday mm. for all the colonists on Mars, where they will celebrate and give each other gifts and. Uh, tell stories about earth and uh, do all and, and i think these traditions and holidays and like local spirituality and stuff like that i think is interesting to think about and it probably will be named after a person by the way you know judging by most of the 
most of the celebrations that we have, probably on Saints, etc. And maybe they can name the Storm uh, Holiday Stormy Daniels. Stormy Daniels? Yeah, <laughs> I think that would be. That would be. I, I, I thought you were. I thought you were going to say it's going to be Muskism. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think I, I, I'm, if that's not already coined, I want to coin that term, muskism. Yes, yeah. muskism. That's going to be the worst holiday. <laughs> anyway, uh, Seb, thank you, thank you for, thank you for doing this conversation with me. Of course, it's absolutely fucking lovely to have you in Sofia again. It's an absolute thank you. pleasure. And yeah, uh, let's go have some uh, some uh, coffees. Yes, thank you so much for having me again. And also, thank to all of our viewers uh, on YouTube or to our listeners in our podcast, whatever podcast stream you're using. Uh, if you'd like uh, to uh, support us in a more practical way, you can always go to ratio.bg support. Thank you for being with us and goodbye.